people. I'm Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report. It is March 6th, 2022. We are live streaming on Rumble. You, what? It's 2020. Damn. Ah. You see the years going by so fast and I got the kids down there and the pooping and the screaming and ah. right before the show, I can't believe this. I can't believe it. Right before the show, I said to the guys, as I often do, what do you think? What do you think we're going to get to today? Now, I, out of one to 10, obviously 10 being the best, one being the worst. And I always say, you cannot, you can't get a 10. A 10, it's just, you just can't do it. It's like the NBA dunk contest. When they give a guy a 10, it's like, no, there can never be anything better. I don't accept that. To me, a nine, eight is a perfect show, right? No coughs, no stumbles, no errors, no sound issues, no nothing, just perfection. And of course, that the content is going to be pretty solid. Now I'm feeling very good today. I'm feeling very sharp and refreshed. I also, I have not been in studio since Wednesday because our Thursday and Friday shows were pre-taped because I was in New York uh, doing Gutfeld. So I'm feeling very good about it. We do our run through this morning and you know, the run through takes us about 20 minutes and it's all the clips making sure everything's in order and you know, feeling good. And I'm looking at all this and I'm going, we got a tremendous show today. And also the content I think is really good today. Like I'm really feeling good about this whole thing. And I say to them, all right, what do you guys think today? Daphne lowballs me at a nine five and she's very critical. She's very critical. But you have to remember she's, you know, she's my assistant. She's makes my doctor's appointments and things. She, she knows things. So maybe she has some information. Uh, Phoenix says uh, nine eight, like you're going to nail it. Amazing. I want to support you in your mission to do a good program for the people. Very exciting. I turned to Connor. He doesn't even give me a number. He goes, well, it's a dense show. The implication being I could screw up a whole bunch of things. And then I literally start the show by telling the wrong year. Should we just end the stream now? We'll do this tomorrow. Go get lunch. All right, all right. Let's reset. This is a little nuts. Here, let's just, everyone take a sip of whatever you're sitting there with. It's March 6th, 2023. Great year. Very fast happening year. We're live streaming right now in the usual spots. We've got a post-game show for you at rubenreport.locals.com. And we do have a tremendous show. If you can grant me just a little bit of a leash on what just happened with the uh, error related to the year, if you can just give me that, I really think we can pull off a 9-8 here if we just start the grading now. I know that's not how these things are done. We'll have to talk to the lawyers, you know, the number crunchers, the accountants, et cetera. But if you can just from right when I finish this sentence I'm saying now. We have a tremendous show for you guys. Uh, if you didn't see it, there were, there were so many breaking clips over the weekend, it really was nuts. I must have sent you, how many things did I send you this weekend? Like, like 40 things, it was really crazy. So the big thing that happened that was lighting the internet on fire and was so in line with so much of what we do here is that Russell Brand, you guys know Russell Brand, comedian, actor, uh, he's big on Rumble, of course, and, and now political commentator, Russell Brand, he went on real time with Bill Maher. And if you have not seen these clips, he basically burned down the machine, the corporate media machine, the medical machine, like the entire thing. So we got a couple clips of that. And then, and this one was so beautiful. It was like handing me the most wonderful gift and saying, take this and enjoy this for the rest of your life. Uh, Crazy socialist Bernie Sanders was also on real time. He did the private interview at the top of the show. That's just the one-on-one -on -one with Bill. And then he joined later on the panel. And it was just incredible. Bill asked him the most basic question ever related to equity and equality, which is what every socialist, communist, these collectivists, the wokesters, this is their thing, that equity, where we finish, is more important than equality, where we begin. And Bill gives him the easiest question in the history of the world for somebody that has pushed this toxic ideology on America, perhaps more than anyone, and he has no freaking idea. Yeah, it's just absolutely incredible. So anyway, we're framing the show around those clips. And then we've got a whole bunch of other sort of machine comedians lying about a bunch of stuff. And basically the whole idea today is how the machine's policies actually cause serious damage. But people are freaking waking up in droves. Let the 9-8 begin. All right, we start with Real Time with Bill Maher. Friday night, uh, Russell Brand was on with MSNBC contributor John Heilman. Now, this guy, John Heilman, I don't, he's going to be destroyed. You're going to see it. It's painful. 
It's watching a man be burned alive. We got a couple clips of it. I don't really mean to make this about him. He's just an MSNBC hack. That's the point. He's just a guy who gets up there. Note his body language, the stumbly, fumbly way he talks versus the just clarity and passion of Russell Brand. So this first clip is they're talking about Fox News and they're all going off on Fox News. And Fox News, of course, is the evil punching bag uh, and the boogeyman for these people because Fox News takes the counter position of everything else mainstream, MSNBC, CNN, ABC, CBS, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's easy to always go after Fox. They're the only one doing anything different. But Russell, who's a lefty, he is a lefty. Oh, and I have him on the show live in Miami in a couple days. Uh, he is a lefty. He sort of defends, that's not really a defense of Fox, but watch how he turns this on Heilman, MSNBC, and the rest of it. This is mwah, beautiful. We have to take responsibility for our own perspective. I, I've been on that MSNBC, yeah, mate. It was right. propagandist nutcrackery yeah. on you know there. You, I went on the show called Morning Joe. Yeah. It was absurd the way they carried Good on. Good morning, Joe. Yes, yeah, it, I don't it. know what it was. It wasn't morning. There was no one called Joe there. No one could concentrate. They didn't understand the basic tenets of journalism. No one was willing to stick up for genuine American heroes uh, like Edward Snowden. No one was willing to talk about Julian Assange and what he suffered trying to bring real journalism to the American people. And I think to sit within the castle of MSNBC throwing rocks oh. at Fox News is ludicrous. My friends, Make my MSNBC friend. my better. Friend, Make friend, MSNBC friend, great friend, again. My friend, I would love... I would... The moment... The mo Why is it on a territory Russell, you can win on, Joe? Russell, Russell, darling, um, the moment that you give me a specific example an actual example. Okay, I'll give you oh, one. Right, just wait, 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 that we know that the election wasn't stolen You've or something equivalent, this example. but I will go. I but I will go out. But I will go out on television and say the okay. opposite. I will lie. When's I'll, my answer? We, we give, just give me a. Give me the specific example. I understand the basic okay. part. Give me a specific I, 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 example. I, 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 all right, all right. I'm with you. I think it's a false equivalency, Russell. It's a no, it's I, not. I, That's I, your I, own bias. It's, a false equivalency. It's, a, it's not I, about bias. It's a false equivalency because you don't <clears> actually know anything about any of these organizations you're talking about. Even on MSNBC once. Big f***ing deal. My Okay, we're gonna show you Russell's answer, don't worry. But before Russell gets to his answer, if I was sitting there, you've watched this show before, you've heard me go through the litany, the long list of lies that these people have promoted. I scribbled down a few of the greatest hits while I was watching this clip once again. How about Donald Trump, very fine people on both sides that he uh, did not condemn the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists in Charlottesville. You all know that is a lie that has been promoted on MSNBC relentlessly. And in Joe Biden's campaign launch video, he says that moment was when he decided to run for president. Uh, we could do masks, we could do vaccines. The Covington kids are racist. Kyle Rittenhouse is a white supremacist. Brett Kavanaugh is a serial rapist. Uh, DeSantis on Don't Say Gay. DeSantis on AP African-American Studies. I mean, we could go on on and on with the things that they've lied about. Russell responded. Do you want an example? Do yeah, you yes. want an example? Yes. The ludicrous, outrageous criticisms of Joe Rogan around ivermectin, re deliberately referring to it as a horse non, medicine when they know it's an effective non medicine. Yeah, that, that's what not a Rachel example. Maddow turning up on the TV saying, if you take well, this vaccine, you're not going to get it, when it hadn't been clinically trialed for transmission. You have to listen. Wait, Do you think you can improve response. America by determinately and avowedly condemning Fox News without acknowledging that you're participating in the same game? I'm, Did you not? Not just listen to Bernie <laughs> Sanders, someone who plainly legitimately believes in this country and believes it's possible to change, but is bound by corruption, is bound by the lobbying system. Surely it's clear to you, Bill, as one of the great pundits and experts and comic voices, that systemic change is required. Money has to be taken out of politics. We need new political systems that genuinely represent ordinary Americans so that we can overcome cultural differences. And bickering about which propagandist network is the worst is not going to save a single American life, not improve the life of a single American child, not going to improve America's standing in the world, and the world needs a strong American.
America, I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that. So you have an obligation, a duty, not to condemn these people. And Brand is really good. And look, I have some differences with him and I'm gonna discuss them with him. I think we're doing it on Wednesday. Maybe we'll do it live altogether. We were gonna tape it, but maybe we'll just air it live and we'll, we'll get audience questions and, and a whole bunch more. We'll, we'll discuss how we're gonna do that. I just wanna jump back to the first clip for a moment because Bill, at one point when he chimed in, he said it was a false equivalency that Russell was making, meaning that, if you, that MSNBC is clearly not as bad as Fox. Now, I just simply don't believe that that is true. I am not defending everything that Fox has done. For sure, they make mistakes, they've, they've angled things certain ways, fine. I go on there, they let me say whatever I want. I never give talking points, I only do interviews live, etc. cetera. Uh, but MSNBC has been far worse because it is the machine. It is always pushing the machine's lies. Fox, as a conservative network, is at least slightly taking another road. However, to Russell's point, bickering about which one of them is worse is actually not gonna help anybody. It's why I often say on the show, how much attention should we pay to MSNBC and CNN and the rest of these things? I think you still, it's not bickering. I still think you have to shine a light on their lies because that will help wake up people, right? Even Russell himself, who's, who's newly, I think, sort of red pill to some of this stuff. I think he's realized the Russell of 2023 is probably very, very different than the Russell of 2018, who probably bought and swallowed more of those MSNBC, the sort of lefty lies. Okay, so anyway, when, when I saw this clip, I was like, man, this is, this is so perfect on so many fronts because this is, this is so what I talk about all the time. And here you have a lefty. Again, he's a Bernie Sanders admirer. I can't stand Bernie Sanders. And again, I will get into it with him on that on Wednesday. Um, but you have a lefty saying what so many of us across the political spectrum are saying right now. And you have them Bill, who's still not quite seeing it, but like, man, there's a lot here, right? Like there's, there's some richness here. So I watched the clip and then I said to Phoenix, I was like, listen, why don't we just grab after he blows up this John Heilman guy, why don't we just grab any compilation clip? We've played them a million times of MSNBC just lying relentlessly, right? We've shown you these clips all the time. It doesn't even matter what they're lying about. You guys got it. They're just lying about everything all the time. And then we were about to grab one of those clips that we've played before, right? We've got a catalog of things that we can just go to. And then of course on Twitter, literally like 20 seconds later, I see this clip from MSNBC over the weekend. And there's at least, I counted five lies within a minute and 10 seconds. Take a look. Our historian's perspective, what we're about to witness is Trump, with Trump is something unprecedented. He's still facing multiple investigations uh, as this 2024 race gets underway. So how do you think um, this plays into the narrative of his uh, efforts to become not just the nominee, but the next president of the United States with all of this legal baggage hanging over his head. We haven't seen anything like this in history before. No, we have not. We haven't seen a president potentially indicted like this, and it may not be the most physically fit person uh, of that age that I have ever seen. So you've got that. But the even more dangerous thing, Stacey and Michael, is that, you know, People who try to get a nomination in parties, you know, do it by trying to appeal to what they think will work. Well, look what Rick DeSantis has done in Florida. He was known as sort of a nondescript uh, political leader, member of Congress. Suddenly, he really has tried to turn himself into sort of a local Mussolini in Florida with the book banding and the br brutal tactics. And even this week, this suggestion that bloggers have to register with the state for the honor of writing about the governor and other, other political leaders. We have to call this what this is. This is fascism and authoritarianism that goes even beyond what Trump has talked about. That's what he thinks is gonna work in that party. And in a way, that's the scariest thing of all. I'm running out of room on my paper for the amount of lies and distortions there. First off, the guy that's hosting that, that is Michael Steele, if you do not know him. I once years ago, when I was still a lefty and Michael was on the right. He was the former head of the RNC, the Republican National Committee. Okay, this guy had huge amount of power and was, and I would say was a very sane, moderate conservative who at the very, very beginning of the Trump thing was, was explaining to me, still a lefty at the time, you can find the interview. We did it live uh, on location in Los Angeles years ago. I guess it was 2015, probably fall of 2015, explaining to me why Trump made sense and why people were gonna vote for Trump. Anyway. For a couple hundred thousand bucks, which I know is not nothing, he has completely sold his soul and he, and he hosts a show 
as a conservative on MSNBC. It's like, it's, it's so soulless, it's ridiculous. But putting him aside, there were many factual errors in there. Uh, first off, he implies that Donald Trump is not physically fit to be president. We have no evidence of that. There is plenty of evidence that Joe Biden is not physically fit. Uh, he called Ron DeSantis Rick DeSantis. I don't know if that was a lie or maybe just a mistake. Uh, he's turning into Mussolini. I would say that's a, a bit of a stretch of the truth, wouldn't you? Uh, this thing about registering reporters, uh, that has nothing to do with DeSantis. It's one random congressman and it's not gonna happen, but that's just a moot point. Uh, and then, you know, f he's t basically a fascist and authoritarian. He's actually the reverse of those things. An authoritarian would be locking their people in their homes and not letting kids go to school and making sure that they got injected with experimental poison and a bunch of stuff like that. He's doing the reverse of those things. Oh, the book bannings. There are no book bannings here. I don't know why it is that that guy, by the way, that guy, uh, Beschloss, I think is his last name. He's a, he's a presidential historian. So I don't know why he's giving analysis on this sort of thing. Uh, but for some reason, he also seems to want children, third graders to get books about giving hand jobs. I don't know. You know, what well, that's, that's his thing. Anyway, you see the point within, within 10 seconds of playing the the Russell Brand clip and trying to figure out, okay, can we find something with MSNBC lies or MSNBC distortions, or let's just say swerves around the truth. Look how many in just this ridiculously silly clip. Anyway, then Russell Brand continued. You could see he was like feeling the mojo and I think he was digging the crowd and the whole freaking thing. And then he just lit a match and here we go. We have a complicated relationship with the pharmaceutical industry. Anybody who's ever had a uh, a, a family member who's had cancer um, and, and seen what uh, life-saving drugs can do for people. It also and, may have given it to them. And, and, and it may have, but that's actually kind of my, but that's actually kind of my point here, <laughs> is like the, the reality is right. that like, if you have a black and white point of view, the pharmaceutical industry right. is engaged in a giant yeah. conspiracy to fuck us all over. You are denying the reality no. that many people have, have lives been saved by those drugs. If you say the pharmaceutical industry has no, right. has, is, is incapable of error or, or, no. mali or, mal or malign behavior, you're equally an idiot. Out of respect for you and your show, <laughs> I've brought some facts. Mm. Would you? <laughs> If you like, oh, they're oh. actually... Well, you, just, you just get the fuck out of here. This thought, is not the place. Well, you like the facts. pandemic created at least 40 new far, big pharma billionaires. Pharmaceutical corporations like Moderna and Pfizer made $1,000 of profit every second from the COVID-19 <laughs> vaccine. More than well. two-thirds of Congress received campaign funding from pharmaceutical companies in the 2020 election. Pfizer chairman Albert Baller told Time magazine in July 2020 that his company was developing a COVID vaccine for the good of humanity, not for money. And, of course, Pfizer made $100 billion dollars okay. in profit right. in 2022. Right. If you have right. an economic system in which pharmaceutical companies benefit hugely from medical emergencies, where a military industrial okay. complex benefits from war, where energy companies benefit from energy crises, you are going to He's generate right. states of perpetual crisis yes. where the interests of ordinary and, and, people well, yes. and, separate from the interests of the elite. And... Yes, that is right, Russell Brand. Well said. We will continue that on Wednesday. But you get the point, guys. Like, every now and again, a little truth can get through the machine. And he somehow, you know, the if you've got a wall here, and there's like this little crack, so truth is just trying to get through, like a big wave is coming. And then there's this wall, and it stops this thing. It's a dam. But then there's a crack in the dam. A little bit of truth can leak out to the other side. But he put a freaking serious, serious crack in that thing, and a whole bunch came out on the other side. Now, he and I have different opinions on what the role of government is or, or can actually accomplish. I think that would maybe make, uh, would, would, in, would, allow you to see the difference of opinion in conclusion that we've come to. And that's fine. That's absolutely just fine. Uh, but he just told some serious truth there. Now let's contrast truth with endless BS. Because as I mentioned, the other guest on the show was Bernie Sanders. Now Bernie Sanders has been a in essence, a socialist, borderline communist, I would say, in the United States government for 30 plus years. What year did he get into the Senate? It's, it's at least 30 years at this point. Um, Bernie, other than ushering in uh, the idea that socialism, that you should take from some and give to others, and that's, that's how you're nice, right? That's how you're a, a good person, which actually that means you're kind of jealous and you're not allowed to steal, but 
he, other than pushing that idea on young people, he's accomplished virtually nothing in his entire career. There are no major bills passed with his name on it. There was one thing related to, I think it was like Vermont uh, sanitation or something that he did like 20 years ago. He's accomplished nothing other than he does have three houses and he became a millionaire. Uh, while doing this. He was a first elected into office in 1971, five years before I was born a senator in 2007. So he was a congressman first for a while. But he's, he's accomplished a whole bunch of nothing other than push a lot of bad ideas in. This video that I'm about to show you with Bill Maher is so unbelievable, it should end it. It should all end. Bernie should today just walk into his office and say, I'm sorry, guys, I, the truth is I spoke like this so people thought I was nice and my hair was kind of messy and I was always saying that rich people are mean so a bunch of young morons were listening to me, but clearly I don't know what I'm doing and I'm just going to retire now. I'll move in with John Fetterman wherever he is. We'll sit. We'll, it'll be quiet. Okay. Just watch this. Bernie does not know the difference between equality and equity. This is... The number one principle of socialism. This is the number one, the top, the pinnacle of this of at the set of ideas that Bernie believes in, that he has pushed on us, that capitalism is e e evil, that socialism is good, that somehow if you give the state enough power, it can rejigger things enough so we all end up the same. And he literally cannot even explain it. But it's not that he can't explain it. You can actually watch his brain explode at one point. I mean, this is in freaking credible videotape. Equality, that like, it's the same word. And it's not the same word in the same concept. So how would you differentiate between equity and equality? Well, equality, we talk about, uh, I don't know what the answer to that is. <laughs> Tell me to think of it, you know, uh, equality is equality of opportunity. All right? We live in a society we want all people right. to have whatever color your skin is. Equity, I think, is more guarantee of outcome, is it not? I, yeah, think. I think so. I think that's okay. Right. So which do you come? Which side do you come down on? Uh, equality. Equality. Yeah. Okay. Right. He literally should have poured gasoline on his head and burned himself alive right there. That should be the end of it. I know it won't be the end of it, but any sane person, if you have any roughly approximately sane lefty in your family and they still think Bernie is good or Bernie knows what he's talking about, show them that clip. He does not know the basics. This is not calculus 704. This is math 101 and he does not know it. When he just flat out admits, I don't know. I don't know. And then he explains why equality is good. But he is the one that has been screaming and screaming about social justice and this and that and uh, Bernie Sanders. He is the one that is for affirmative action, which is state-sponsored discrimination, which is against equality. He is the one that has brought in all of this crazy woke nonsense, right? So that we will hire based on skin color and your genitals and your perceived gender and all of the rest of it. And he doesn't even know it. And then at the end, when Bill tries to help him, right? Bill's explaining it. Oh, you don't, you really don't even know what the basics of your shit is. And then he basically says he's for equality. It's not us that should be done with Bernie. We, the, all the sane people should have been done with Bernie a long, long time ago. The social justice warriors, the lefties, the true socialists, you got to take him out now, right? Like you guys have to be done with Bernie Sanders. He is against equity. Let's not forget the day before the last election, last presidential election, Kamala Harris put up a cartoon where she fully admitted she was a socialist. Remember that cartoon? We played it here. Maybe we'll play it again tomorrow, where she says it's not where we all start, it's where we all end up, that we should all end up equally. That is equity. And you're going to have to hurt a lot of people because some people are smarter and some people are work harder and some people have a little bit more at the beginning. It's true. But sometimes somebody with nothing becomes something awesome. That's the gestalt of life. That's what it's all about. This should end Bernie, but I got plenty more to bury Bernie. Let's just bury freaking Bernie. Student debt, that's another thing. He wants to wipe out student debt because it's part of social justice because black lesbians are in debt and we've got to do something about it. 
Bill Maher wrecks him on that. And Bill, by the way, Bill likes Bernie. Bill's not trying to wreck him. Bill's trying to help him in a bizarre way, but Bernie Sanders. And again, this is against why people sometimes, I think, question some of what you're saying. Uh, this is a survey, student loan forgiveness recipients. Seventy-three percent of applicants say they are likely to spend their extra money on non-essential, including vacations, smartphone, drugs, and alcohol. They, they admitted that to the pollster. Now, who is this pollster? I, NBC, <laughs> NBC News. Um, Fifty-two percent, they are very likely or likely to buy new clothing. Forty-six percent, they would use the money for vacation and eat out at restaurants. This is why people have a thing about, I, I would never call it free money. Oh, I guess I just did. Bill, yeah, you're right, Bill. You've brought him on many times over the years to spout his nonsense. And, and you now, as what I would say is a sane lefty, are realizing that these endless bailouts, just giving people cash, but it's not giving people cash because you have to take it from other people. Also, we will soon find out that it is completely unconstitutional for the government to just wipe out your debt. I have 28 years more mortgage on this house, 30 year loan. I'd prefer not to pay it. Could someone do something about that? Can we get Biden on the phone? Can we get that cleared out? What do I need that on the books for? It's, it's absolutely incredible. So Bernie doesn't believe in the poll. He also just, part of being a socialist is not understanding anything about basic human psychology. If you give a bunch of 19 year olds cash, right? You just give them cash back. They could get a hundred grand back on the debts. How much was it? I think it was a hundred grand, right? It was, it was gonna max out at a hundred grand, I think the, the debt uh, for colleges, whatever it is, even if it was 10 grand, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter what the number is. And by the way, whether it was $7, or whether it was $100,000, it would still be unconstitutional. But let's put that aside for a moment. If you just give people stuff, whether it's subsidized housing, or whether it's food stamps, or whether it's cash, because they spent too much to get into a college that they couldn't afford, it doesn't mean that they're all gonna do the right thing and, get, and, and use that money effectively. Most of them probably will buy weed, and they will buy video games. What are the kids playing these days? What? Last of Us. It's also a television show. Thank you. That's right. Up to $20,000, by the way, was what uh, the Biden administration was proposing. They are going to use the money on a whole bunch of stuff, but Bernie doesn't buy that because they don't understand basic human psychology. They just like the very thin veneer. The very thin veneer is we'd like to help these people and these people, it's, I assume it's a lot of minorities and the lesbians and the people with one leg and we've got to help them and blah, blah, blah. But if you don't think that Bernie is a fraud beyond human imagination, beyond imagination, who has no balls, by the way, Bernie, you have no balls either. Bernie from the movie had more balls than you and he was accomplishing a hell of a lot more and he was dead. We get it, Bernie. So you got it. You got it. Everyone got that. Okay. Um, Bernie has no balls either because if he had balls, when Hillary Clinton destroyed him, and he, and he actually had the movement of the Democrat party as backwards and ridiculous as I think that movement is, he should have launched a campaign against her, right? He should have gone off and created a third party. That was his moment, but he didn't, he backed her. And now he's just on his descent to nothingness. Uh, but on the way to his descent to nothingness, he's also really into war. So that's fun for the socialists, enjoy. Should America send F-16s? It's not an issue that I've been heavily involved in, but I, I support what the president is doing. I think what Putin did was outrageous, not only for the people of the Ukraine and all the destruction, not only for the thousands and tens of thousands of Russian soldiers who have been dying. We need a world now, if we're gonna combat climate change, if we're gonna combat future pandemics, we need a world to come together. And Putin has radically disrupted that, and that is a real tragedy. But I think at the end of the day, the United States, NATO cannot sit back and allow Putin's aggression to go uh, un unresponded. Guys, I, I don't know if you know this, but I I'm not a lefty. Has anyone ever made note of that? Um, I was a lefty, but I'm not a lefty anymore. But if I was a lefty, I would be so pissed at, th at that fraud. Like, I'm not pissed at him now. Like, I'm, I'm rather emotive today. It's true. Uh, I think I've had a lot of coffee. Um, but I'm not pissed at him. Like, he's just showing me what he is. But if I was a lefty, if I had been a believer in a Bernie bro, a believer in all of this socialist nonsense and the power to the people and all of this stuff that all sounds good but never works and socialism and collectivism always kill a couple hundred million people and blah, 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 it never accomplishes anything. And I know the socialists always say, but we've never done it exactly right yet. The thing is, we just haven't had a chance. 
the idea that Bernie, first off, he hasn't been heavily involved in the war. That's funny because Bernie's very concerned about money, right? He always wants money so he can do what he wants, not his money. He wants to take someone else's money. It's always those rich, mean billionaires who usually create a lot of stuff and a lot of jobs and industries and all that. He wants to take their money and he wants to give it to other people. In this case, where we've given Ukraine, I think now we're over $120 billion, uh, he's not that interested in this. This isn't something he's paid much attention to, right? He doesn't pay much attention to that. He's mostly focused on whether Starbucks workers in Boston will be able to unionize. That's really where he's focused, not on the $120 billion. But besides that, uh, he really... Uh, there somehow, I mean, it's just so incredible what they do. Somehow he linked, we must stop Russia so that we can all work together on climate change and future pandemics. What planet is this old socialist buffoon on? I don't know. I genuinely do not know. But congratulations. Like if you've been a Bernie supporter, this is your moment. You can now realize that the king of your socialist movement, who by the way, was gonna be destroyed. I mean, the, the whole purpose of these movements is to eat the revolutionaries, right? So Bernie, at the end, it was always going to end poorly for him because at the end, he was just an old white guy who became a millionaire somehow, even though he's been in government since 1971 as a socialist, somehow became a millionaire with three houses, right? Um, but it was always gonna end poorly for him because he was gonna be an old white guy at the end and the, and the radicals and the BLM people and the wokesters, of course they were gonna take him out. So Bernie, you're on your way out, dude. The machine is just about done with you and, and that equity versus equality thing. I mean, that would literally be like asking LeBron James, do you know the difference between a free throw and a three pointer? And him being like, I don't, how many dribbles before you travel? Like, it, it, it's so incredible. It's just absolutely amazing. But let's continue because the machine, you guys know about the machine. And, and I love the fact, oh, one other thing on the Russell Brand thing. First off, I love the fact that he was talking about the machine, right? Because it's this, it's this amorphous, hard to describe thing that seemingly is in front of us all the time. So we have to respond to it all the time. But the other thing that I loved is he brought receipts. What do I always say? Bring receipts to these shows. What did Ted Cruz do on The View that day when they asked him about election denialism and Donald Trump and the, and the MAGA, the ultra MAGA Republicans, they deny elections and Ted Cruz. Well, speaking of denying election, that the Hillary Clinton and Stacey Abrams and da 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 do. So the fact that he did that was prepared and ready to roll. And one of the reasons that this Heilman guy and whose body language was just terrible and his sort of stammering, condescending way of speaking to him. One of the reasons that he can't back anything up is they're not used to having to make an argument because they go on these ridiculous shows and they, they get puffed up with no pushback, right? Uh, we'll get to plenty more on that in just a second. So uh, let's just talk a little bit more about the machine because one of the guys that I always talk to you is just like a front end facing, just sort of soulless version of what the machine chokes out is Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel, who has been in blackface many times, his former girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, Sarah Silverman, has also been in blackface. But the, the Hollywood portion of the machine is very important because there's a political version of the machine, right? That's always pushing big government. The Hollywood portion is always pushing all of the bad ideas so that they can win the culture wars. So basically people will be stupid enough to believe in the political version of it. Anyway, here's Jimmy Kimmel, who has gotten everything wrong related to COVID, who has called everybody racist, who is, you know, again, he's in blackface, the whole thing. Uh, here he is mocking Aaron Rodgers. You guys know uh, quarterback Aaron Rodgers uh, because Aaron Rodgers is kind of interested in who Jeffrey Epstein was, uh, you know, getting those chicks for. Uh, but somehow Jimmy Kimmel decided that that's uh, worthy of joking about. Needless to say, all this UFO talk has the tinfoil hatters going wild, including Green Bay whack packer Aaron Rodgers, who offered this hot take on the Pat McAfee show. I, I believe that this has been going on for a long time. Interesting uh, timing on everything. There's a lot of other things going on in the world. Did you hear about the Epstein client list uh, about to be released, too? What's that? What are you talking about? There's some files that have, have some names on it that might be uh, getting released pretty soon. Oh. Oh. <laughs> might be time to revisit that concussion protocol, Aaron. That's what? First off, Jeffrey Epstein, who died in jail, um, died in jail. Somehow the cameras went off. Remember, it was very bizarre. The cameras went off, died in jail. 
Uh, then he has his sidekick, Giselle Maxwell, right? And she's still in jail right now, but they are both in jail for basically trafficking young women to all of these people. And we've all seen the videos of Epstein Island and the flights with Bill Clinton and all these other world leaders and everything else. Now, I don't, I have no idea more than you do as to what the real truth around this thing is. But it seems a little bizarre that the guy who is in, sort of in charge of the whole operation, he dies in jail, the cameras go out, okay, fine. The other woman ends up in jail. Why wouldn't you want to know the client list? Why would you, why would the only people who should pay for trafficking young children, so raping young children, the only people who should pay for that are the two people who did the trafficking? What about all the people who did the, I'm gonna, we're gonna get the fucking. They should probably be in trouble too, right? So why is it, why would Jimmy Kimmel choose? Why would, or the machine that's in charge of Jimmy Kimmel, why would it choose to even bring that up to, to mock the people who are putting Attention on it, right? It's the tin foil. What what tin foil hat are you talking about, man? It is completely legit to be like, oh, someone went to jail because they helped a whole bunch of people rape a bunch of children. Maybe we should find out who those people are. I don't even know what the conspiracy he's talking about is. But watch this. So then he continues. The guy's the guy's hanging on by a thread. I mean, all these people. And the thing is, once the machine's done with you, it's just done with you. So you'll get your cash, Kimmel. Like I, you have way more money than me. Good for you. Like you're gonna get your cash and your payouts and all that stuff. And then and then the machine will be done with you one day. It's like it's the Stelter thing. It's the Don Lemon thing. You give it what it wants, and then one day it wants something else. But it's too late for you because you've already sold your soul to it. Am I being clear today? Have I made my feelings clear today? Here's Jimmy Kimmel going after Tucker, but I'm, it, the whole thing turns out to be just a giant cell phone. Watch this one. Speaking of diarrhea, Tucker Carlson of Fox News. <laughs> yesterday, we learned that the, um, the Department of Energy, you probably know about this, believes with what they described as low confidence that COVID may have leaked from a lab in China. Eight federal agencies now have weighed in with their assessments. Four believe COVID came from natural transmission, two say it was a lab leak, and two are still undecided. In other words, we don't know. But the dingbats now see this as some kind of proof that they were right, that the virus came from a Chinese leak at a laboratory, which, by the way, it might have. The point is, we didn't know then. We still don't know now. But what we did know is that Trump and his buddies blaming the Chinese resulted in a great deal of anti-Asian American sentiment and even violence in this country. And that's why it was irresponsible for the president to call it the China virus. But Tucker Carlson apparently disagrees. This plague should never have happened. It could have been stopped. But people chose not to stop it. <laughs> what people? Tomorrow he'll blame the Spanish flu on Antonio Banderas. Yeah. Imagine if you're a comedian and all of a sudden your cue card has all kinds of talking points from politicians and foreign governments on it. Don't read it. You degrade yourself and you become complicit in the greatest crime in history. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, the idea <laughs> that this man would accuse, that I would be accused of reading talking points from foreign governments, if it weren't so brazen, it would almost be funny coming from this loathsome, un-American Moscow mule. Speaking of almost funny, Jimmy, you're nowhere close to it. You're just not in there at all. Uh, there's a whole bunch there to that, that's worth dissecting, but without uh, belaboring the point, uh, even within his attack on Tucker there, uh, he's lying. And of course he's lying about Trump, right? So Trump, Trump called it the China virus and said that it probably came from the Wuhan lab leak, right? Now we, this increasingly is becoming more obvious to most of us. I do not know for 100% Okay, and nor do you. But the fact that for two years you would have been kicked off Twitter or Facebook for even questioning it is fairly interesting. And then the way the machine operates, you all know this, we played the clip last week. John Stewart, then about a year and a half ago, roughly a year ago or so, he goes on Stephen Colbert, another machine show, and he says Wuhan lab leak, and then suddenly everyone is allowed to talk about it. Before that, you would get booted off all of the things. That's partly, I don't know exactly how it all works, but that's partly how the machine stays in front all the time, right? Because it has these, these walls, these firewalls of what is allowed to get out and when, is, when it's allowed to get out. But Kimmel even lies within that because he says that somehow there was this spike in anti-Asian sentiment because Donald Trump said that it was the, the Wuhan, it was the China flu, something like that. It's really interesting because there has been a spike in anti-Asian hate crimes. Virtually all, like 99.9% .9 of them, have been from young black men. 
So am I to believe, in, and they're happening in Philadelphia and it's happening in New York City and Los Angeles and elsewhere. And you've all seen the videos of, I mean, just horrific videos, people going into little mom and pop shops and beating the crap out of people, shooting people, attacking old women on the street, all of this stuff, right? It was happening, we, we've seen two years of this. So he is right about that. But am I to believe Jimmy Kimmel that somehow Donald Trump, who you think is a white supremacist, was signaling to young black men that their white supremacist leader wanted them to attack Asian people? because of what he said about China, which is the place that the virus likely came from. It's just absolutely incredible. So you might be saying to yourself, so why is it that someone like Jimmy Kimmel pays service to the machine so much? Why does he become an absolute hack? I don't know. Tucker is implying that he's getting messaging from a foreign government. I don't know that, but I know that there's a giant corporation involved that keeps Jimmy Kimmel on air to lie about basically all of America and to constantly play up whatever it is they want him to play up. So why is it that he would do that? Now it is, it is cash, right? Everyone's got a number, right? And I don't like impugning motives in such a way. Uh, but at some level, like if people were gonna pay you, let's say, I don't know, what, what does Jimmy Kimmel make per year? Can we get a number on that? I, I'm guessing it's probably about 15 million a year. And, it, and with you think of all the other ancillary ways he makes money, it's probably a lot more than that. 15, literally I was just making that up. All right, 15 a year. Anyone in here making 15? million a year? Okay, nobody in this room's making 15 million a year. But the point is, there's a price on everybody's head, but there's something else going on here. And the other thing that the machine loves is having something to hold over these people, because then you can get them to basically do anything. So Jimmy Kimmel, who has been a prime purveyor of cancel culture in that he calls everyone racists and bigots and homophobes and all of those things, and he's going out of his way as part of the machine to always go after Tucker Carlson, because he would love Tucker Carlson to be taken out right? Like that is the truth. Tucker would, does, Tucker is the number one show in the history of late night. He has no need to go after Jimmy Kimmel, but Jimmy Kimmel's always going after him, right? So then it becomes a little bit of like a rap war, like rappers that hate each other, they go after each other. It's kind of net good for everybody. But there's something else with Jimmy Kimmel. The thing is that Jimmy Kimmel hosted a show called The Man Show. And on that show with my buddy, his co-host was my buddy, Adam Carolla, I didn't know Adam at the time. We've, we've since become friends. Adam Carolla is still a funny comedian, a politically incorrect, actually funny comedian. But you're not gonna believe this, guys. They used to make jokes about gay people on that show and about women and sometimes midgets, like everything. Uh, so you think maybe Jimmy Kimmel's playing along to the machine because the machine doesn't want you to see things like this because then he might get canceled and that would be a bad shame because Jimmy Kimmel want his $15 million. Tell us what you think of the statue. I mean, do you think that she's, do you think that she, I mean, do you think that she's attractive or not? Mm -hmm. Take another look at it. We were all saying during that, like, I'm never going back to LA. Like, they're never gonna let me back in. It's, a, you know, when I went back a couple weeks ago for uh, the PragerU thing, uh, I did have, I had a nice Italian meal at a place, something wolf, mother wolf or something really nice pasta over there. The meatballs were delicious, but I'm pretty sure I can never go back. But anyway, these, these comedians, comedians are supposed to fight the power. Comedians are supposed to tell you something true, but you can see what Jimmy Kimmel's doing there. He has to atone for his past sins by, by praying to their modern golden calf, right? And he's not the only one, Jon Stewart, and this one's kind of disappointing. I, I interned at The Daily Show in 1999. I had a couple decent interactions with Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart, although I think in his heart of hearts, he's probably just a decent liberal, but he has been whacked out and broken by, by the woke machine. And here he is relentlessly and, and in the most smug, I mean, watch this. I, I could not be this smug if I tried. In the most smug, condescending tone, going after an Oklahoma state senator, his name is Nathan Dom. I don't know why he agreed to do this show. Like you gotta know you're being set up the entire time. But John thinks that drag shows for kids are very, very important. We've got to support drag shows for kids. I'm gonna go out on a limb here, John Stewart, if you're watching, you've never taken your kid to a drag show. And I'm pretty sure that, I don't know if you have sons or daughters, but I'm pretty sure if your son came home and said he was a girl, uh, you'd be pretty pissed about it. But somehow you think that drag shows for kids are great and you gotta mock the people who are trying to do something about it. You wanna ban drag show readings to children. To my house, yes. Why? 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 What are you protecting? Why can we prohibit children from voting, those under 18 from voting? Why are you banning, also that? Is, is that free speech? Are you infringing on that performer's free speech? 
they can continue to exercise their free speech, just not in front of a child. Why? Because the government does have a responsibility to protect. I'm sorry? The government does have a responsibility uh -huh. in certain instances to What's protect children. What's the leading cause of death amongst children in this country? And I'm going to give you a hint. It's not drag show readings to children. Correct, yes. So what is it? I'm presuming you're going to say it's firearms. No, I'm not going to say it like it's an opinion. That's what it is. It's firearms. More than cancer, more than car accidents. And what you're telling me is you don't mind infringing free speech to protect children from this amorphous thing that you think of. But when it comes to children that have died, you don't give a flying fuck to stop that because that shall not be infringed. That is hypocrisy at its highest order. John, you are a hack at the highest order. Like, I, he, he's unbearable. I don't even know what to say about him. I, I think Jimmy Kimmel might be more likable than Jon Stewart at this point. First off, the, the guy should not have gone on the show. No one should be falling for these things anymore, right? Like, it's, it's so obvious. Uh, but, you know, John, uh, infringing on someone's rights related to drag shows and, and kids, do you think it's okay to show porn to children? Like, obviously you don't. So this isn't purely a First Amendment free speech issue. The government, do, unless you're an anarchist, I guess maybe you're a complete anarchist, John, and you believe that the government has no role, no responsibility when it comes to absolutely anything. But as I often say about this drag show children thing, why is it that they simply want to do this for kids? Why is it that drag shows are not happening at the annual actuary conference? We know that actuaries love having a good time. Just ask the accountants. Okay, why is it at the National Shoe Salesman event, you know, they don't have the drag queens, right? They only want to do this for kids. And why does he feel the need to defend it. No one's defending chi children getting shot, and we can all have a debate about how we would stop doing that. Now, John, of course, because he's a lefty and part of the machine, his answer would always be to take the guns. But of course, you know, generally good people with guns don't shoot a whole bunch of people. That's how it works. I thought we'd just give you a little bit more information on, uh, on gun deaths just because we're go we've gone this far. Here's uh, some info from the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the CDC recently released updated official mortality data showed that 45,222 firearm-related deaths in the U.S. in 2020, a new peak. These new data show a sharp 13.5% increase in the crude rate of firearm-related deaths from 2019 to 2020. This change was driven largely by firearm homicides, which saw a 33.4 increase in the crude rate from 2019 to 2020, whereas the crude rate of firearm suicides increased by 1.1%. From 2019 to 2020, the relative increase in the rate of firearm-related deaths of all types, suicide, homicide, unintentional, and undetermined, among children and adolescents was at 29.5%, more than twice as high as the relative increase in the general population. I'll, I'll get into why I'm explaining all this in just a moment. In addition, drug overdose and poisoning increased by 83.6% from 2019 to 2020 among children and adolescents, becoming the third leading cause of death in that age group. This change is largely explained by the 110% increase in unintentional poisonings from 2019 to 2020. Let's just show you a, a chart here as well. Uh, the leading cause of death among children and adolescents in the U.S. from 1999 to 2020 was motor vehicle car crashes. 1999 to 2020. Interesting. What happened in 2020? These crashes have been declining dramatically over the past 20 years. Firearm-related injuries uh, were also declining until 2013 when they steadily began to rise. And then it spiked in 2020. So why... Is there some weird aberration in 2020? Do you think it has something to do uh, with keeping kids at home and school lockdowns and making them afraid of the climate and viruses and then sending them out to riot and not having an honest discussion about crime and domestic violence and child abuse and drugs and then also the doom scrolling on Twitter and, and what the algorithms are doing to manipulate everybody? So I am not saying there isn't any issue at all related to, I, we'd all like less children to be killed by guns for sure. But the an, if you think the answer is the government should just come in and take them, but okay, the gun thing is a completely separate issue. The point is, why is John paying service to the machine to go out there to defend drag queens for children? Why? 
I, I would ask you that question. Like, what is the answer? What is the answer? And then just like, you know, I'm telling you guys, I, I have done some version of this show now for like eight years, interviewing people, telling people what I think, everything else. Like the idea that I would ever sit with someone and be so smug and condescending to them, even if I had AOC on, let's say I had like the worst of the worst. If I had Bernie Sanders sitting across from me or I had AOC or Ilhan Omar, or any of the people that ideologically I'm completely uh, opposite of, if I had any of them sitting across from me, the truth is, the real truth, and, I, and I, I certainly hope you would believe me on this, is that I would treat them the same way I treat every other guest. I have had plenty of guests on who I did not agree on certain things. I have had Ben Shapiro on making his religious case against same-sex marriage, and we treated each other with respect, okay? I have debated abortion with plenty of people. I have debated death penalty with plenty of people, taxes, all of the things. I can sit across from someone and treat them respectfully. The smug condescend condescension that only a television Hollywood liberal could have at that perfect, that perfect pitch that John does it with. It's just, the, I can't believe it. I cannot believe I'm saying he's, he's worse than Jimmy Kimmel. It's absolutely incredible. But all right, let's find some other terrible people to talk about. Uh, our press secretary, who is one of many LGBT members of the uh, administration. We have more women and gays and we got the whole thing that any other administration or any of them qualified, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Can any of these people get anything done? Does our transportation secretary know about transportation? Who cares? He's gay. Anyway, here's uh, Corinne Jean-Pierre slamming Tennessee Governor Bill Lee uh, because he's signing a law that will restrict children's drag shows. Now, again, they're not arresting drag queens. They are not saying drag queens, you cannot do your drag shows at late night bars where you always have done them or at other events for adults. Uh, we would just prefer you don't do these things for children because it's obviously a very hyper-sexualized event. And this is something that shouldn't be out there for kids. Like any sane person agreed on this 10 years ago, anybody. But now the entire machine is going after anyone who dares speak out against it. Take a look. Right now you have a governor from Tennessee has decided to go after drag shows. What sense does that make to go after drag shows? How does that going to help people's lives uh, who are thinking about uh, the economy, who are thinking about making sure their kids are going, are, are going to be safe when they go to school, or their communities are safe. But that's what he wants to focus on. So it's part of a larger pattern uh, from elected officials who espouse freedom uh, and liberty, but apparently think that freedom of speech only extends to people who agree with them. And that's what we're seeing uh, from what's happening in Tennessee and other places as well. I'm telling you guys, these people are all so deep in the lies, they cannot say anything true. Corinne Jean-Pierre, much like Jen Psaki and so many of these other people, they simply cannot utter one complete sentence that is true. All the conservatives, whatever you want to call it, are doing are just saying enough is enough. You guys will not stop. You are a rebel force that will not stop. And enough people are saying, hey, can we just go back to something that was semi-sane of 10 years ago? No one in their right mind would have said it is okay. I, I've been a couple times over the years to drag shows. First off, I never found them funny or interesting because most of them are just kind of hacky comedians making disgusting sexual jokes. Now, I don't know that all of them are doing that at these kids' things, but no one is coming for anyone's free speech. Go be a drag queen, say whatever you want, but just not in front of children. That's all that some of the states are doing. And I love how she somehow confuses this and, well, you know, these are, there are just regular people out there who want their children to be safe. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. But note the overly emotional way that they do absolutely everything. Remember that video that we showed you last week of the teachers union president, Randy Weingarten, and she was standing in front of the Supreme Court and she was very upset that the Supreme Court might not do what she wants. She wants debt to be wiped out because she needs the money to keep rolling in for the, the public schools and all those things because she's got a very cushy job and somehow she's always in Ukraine hanging out. It's all very bizarre. But what did she do? She gets up there and she starts screaming and she's mad, her arms are flying all over the place and blah. She does all that. And then it's, a, it's like a certain amount of people watch it and they go, oh, she's very emotional, so she must be right. That's what the left has really mastered. Oh, they're always screaming about things, so they must be right because how else could you be so emotional about something? It's, it's like a base level psychological trick. Anyway, here is, oh, uh, do we have a warning for the good people? Yeah. The view, we gotta show you the view. Here's Whoopi, 
who once again, just want to say, loved her in Ghost. Molly, you in danger, girl. But Whoopi has lost, she is smoking too much weed. I've heard from insiders, by the way, that she shows up every day baked. That's what I've just heard, I'm just saying. Just heard. Anyway, uh, here she is, and just, yeah, it's us. It's us that are the problem, not the wokesters. Okay, go, Whoopi. This idea of woke, I'm gonna say it again. Most of y'all were asleep. Who are you speaking, speaking to? I'm talking to when all those all. folks that use that word, okay. woke, all, all right, the time. Y'all right. were asleep. We were never asleep. We had to stay awake watching you. Okay? <laughs> so you woke up and you thought, oh my God, there's, there's lots of women running amok doing things they're not supposed to be doing. And drag queens everywhere. <laughs> and oh my God, people of color. You know, you always talk about the snowflakes. Look in the mirror. Y'all can't seem to handle anything. You can't seem to handle competition from, from Democrats to Republicans. You can't seem to handle the discussions of why people feel the way they do. Your idea is to get rid of everything. So stop calling us snowflakes. Be nice, Dave, try to be nice. All right, do I even have to like comment on that? Like you guys have, been, have started a war a war for children's minds and their bodies. You've tried to racialize everything. You want five-year-olds watching Disney shows that will teach white people, white kids to be guilty by the color of their skin. You guys have done this. Now, finally, finally, and we have to give Donald Trump some credit for this. Donald Trump broke the thing. So people started seeing it. And then other people, culturally and politically, people start getting involved and start pushing back. That's all they're doing. That's all any of us are doing. And you might go, well, but Dave, maybe, maybe you're being a little over the top here. Maybe wokeness isn't that bad. Maybe there aren't a set of people who are truly brainwashed by all of this nonsense. Well, Clay Travis found this online. I thought this was incredible. This is the front page of the New York Times over the weekend. This is a front page article. Black equestrians plead for helmets that fit, and look at that girl there, that apparently that's a black girl, she looks white to me, but I'll, I'll go with it, okay, maybe, maybe the ink on that particular copy was off a little bit. Uh, but she has giant dreadlocks, which I assume is some sort of cultural appropriation of Predator or something like that. And she, the entire article, guys, she's upset that her dreadlocks don't fit into most helmets that people wear while riding horses, and that thus is proving what a racist nation we are. And then, the coffee-drinking Sunday New York Times liberal reads it and they go, my God, darling, did you hear this? This is absolutely extraordinary. There's a black woman who has dreadlocks and mm, that coffee's good. What's that, what's that uh, kind of latte was that? Was that over $12? Well, however much money it costs, it's worth it. But can you believe this? This is systemic racism, darling. This is, this poor woman who has many horses and who rides around, who seems to be doing quite well, I don't know how, despite her, the systemic, uh, you know, discrimination and racism of this country, and she's also on the front page of the New York Times, she needs a bigger helmet. Is there something we can do, darling? No, 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 not give our own money. Can't we complain about it to somebody who might do something else about it? I don't, what accent is that? I turned them in, that, that was more of like a British aristocracy accent, but like, I think you get the point. I don't like these people and I don't like their accents, okay? Anyway, uh, it all continues. It all continues because once you buy into the woke thing and boys are girls and racism is good, especially if it's against white people and all of those things, you will ultimately degrade the entire system because you will not have a meritocracy. You will not have a system where through competition and hard work and human ingenuity, a whole group of people are gonna bust their butts and go, man, there's something I want out there and I'm gonna go get it and I'm gonna be the best at what I can do. That is what this nation was built on. That's why your ancestors came here. Meritocracy, it's good. It is good. Competition, it's good. These people don't want it because they, are, they love the idea of a system that can control everybody. But affirmative action fits right within this. If you say, well, okay, we'd like to help a certain set of people, what you are going to have to do is discriminate an against another set of people. And then you say, okay, well, these people can get into a school in an easier way, and a grad school in an easier way, and a job in an easier way. At some point, whatever job you're trying to put them into, whatever it is that you're, whatever you're trying to get them into, be it an airline pilot 
or a heart surgeon, you are going to have lower quality people because the top, the number one thing when hiring for an important job would be the highest qualification. So you wouldn't want to look at someone's genitals. Lord. Anyway, this is just incredible. Watch this. So uh, this is North Carolina Senator Ted Budd. And he is asking a, uh, a, a nominee to be FAA administrator. His last name's Washington, um, which probably is racist, but he's black, so what are you gonna do? Uh, about FAA policy. Now, if you wanted to be the FAA administrator, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a, uh, a, you know, I'm not an expert in avionics or whatever, but if you wanted to be in charge of the FAA, you'd have to know a lot about flying, I would imagine, policy related to flying, things of that nature. Uh, so they have these hearings because they want to know that this guy's qualified for the job. This is absolutely extraordinary. The man wants to be the FAA administrator. Watch these questions from Ted Budd, and you tell me if this guy should get the job. So Mr. Washington, can you quickly tell me uh, what airspace requires an ADSB transponder? Not sure I can answer that question right now. That's, that's okay. We'll just keep going. So um, that's, a, that's a pretty important part. Mm. So what are the six types of special use airspace that protect this national security that appear on FAA charts? Uh, sorry, Senator, I cannot answer that question. Okay, so what are the operational limitations of a pilot flying under basic med? Senator, I'm not a pilot, so... Uh, but uh, obviously you'd oversee the F Federal Aviation Administration, so um, any, any idea what those uh, restrictions are under basic med, quickly? Uh, well, some of the restrictions I think would be high blood pressure. Uh, some of them would be it's more like how many passengers per airplane, oh, how many pounds okay. in different categories, and uh, what ele what uh, altitude uh, you can fly under. So, and uh, and then uh, amount of knots. It's under 250 knots. So, okay. it's not having have anything to do with blood pressure. So, can you tell me what causes an aircraft to spin or to stall? Uh, again, Senator, I'm not a pilot. Um, okay, uh, let's keep going. What are the three aircraft certifications the FAA requires as part of the manufacturing process? Quickly, please. Uh, three aircraft certifications. Uh, again, uh, what I would say to that is that one of my first priorities would be to fully implement that Certification Act uh, and report You know the three types, uh, Mr. Washington? The, the three no. types? Okay. He's going to get the job. Like, he's going to get the job. I'm telling you, I'm going to learn how to fly a plane. That's it. I'm getting my pilot's license. I'm not kidding. I've said to you a couple times on the show, my goal, really, I, I don't want any more. I have everything I want. I truly mean that. I have everything in this world that I want. Uh, but I, I do want to fly my own plane now. Okay? I, well, I want to fly private would be ideal. I just don't have a lot of time to be learning how to fly. But it does seem kind of cool to learn how to fly. Like, how... If they're going to hire more and more of these people in all of our professional positions, do you wonder why everything seems like it doesn't work anymore? Why it's always harder to get people qualified to do anything? No one knows how to do anything because once you let wokeness in, and this is what you must understand, Whoopi, once you say to people, we should focus on your genitals and your skin color, then everything else, whatever the mission statement of the organization or the nonprofit or the political machine or the school or whatever it is, once you put some other thing, we should focus on this over here instead of the thing, you are going to slowly destroy the thing and we're gonna have literal planes falling out of the sky because we're gonna have unqualified people flying them, but at least the plane will have all its diversity checks off it. It's just completely ridiculous. And with, uh, and I'm just going to say it because you losers at Media Matters are always watching the show. Uh, this is not to be discriminatory against anyone. I'm trying to be anti-discriminatory. I don't care if my pilot is black or gay or a lesbian or whatever. I just want them to be freaking qualified. Okay, let's continue because this government is not interested in doing anything that a qualified set of people would be doing. Here's Corinne Jean-Pierre again. And now remember, Corinne Jean-Pierre, black lesbian. I don't care about that, really. That's wonderful that she's a black lesbian. Spectacular. Really fantastic. You got another word for a black lesbian? Super, what? Fabulous, awesome, great. Um, but here she is, she's just unqualified for her job, which is why she always is bringing up the fact that she's a black lesbian because she's not qualified to do what she's doing. Here she is saying that 173 House Democrats have backed a whole bunch of new laws. And uh, you tell me if anything she says here seems good to you. 
I did talk to the team and we have a couple of things that I just want to lay out for all of you and on what the DC bill does. It reduces maximum penalties uh, for off offenses like murders and other homicides, arm armed home invasion burglaries, armed, armed carjackings, as I mentioned, armed robberies, unlawful gun possession, and some uh, sexual assault offenses. Guys, this is so freaking awesome. Did you catch what she's doing? 173 Democrats, they want to reduce penalties for murders, carjackings, armed robberies, armed home assault, and sexual assault. Great. And you wonder why people are fleeing blue states and cities in droves. Now, you may remember last week, we showed you a clip of Kevin O'Leary. Kevin O'Leary is Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. He was being interviewed. Uh, we showed you a couple clips of it being interviewed by Tucker Carlson, and he's making the rounds. And, and Kevin O'Leary, from where I sit, is a pretty sane, cogent guy who has accomplished an awful lot. He has invested millions and millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars into all sorts of companies. Some of them succeed, some of them fail. Again, that's what it's all about. Competition, meritocracy, try to make something, create something. You, someone else creates something, you gotta make a better mousetrap. It's all beautiful, it's what America is all about, it's what the human spirit is all about. Uh, he now has had it, basically with everything coming out of the Democrat party, the machine, the left, the progressives, all of that stuff. And he's acknowledging that it's actually destroying the blue states. Here he is talking about New York and what AOC and her ridiculous socialist policies uh, have done to New York. And you're not gonna believe this if you watch the end of this thing. Don Lemon, I don't know how this happened. This is a bizarre day. Don Lemon kind of agreed with something that made sense. What is going on? Is there tequila in my coffee? Thousands of jobs coming out of that. I mean, that is, that's New York, uninvestable. Sorry, don't shoot the messenger, just telling you the way it is. Yeah, that's it, we uninvestable. Some pushback from our, our elected officials in New York on that. I was going to say Kathy Hochul. Yeah, uh, but I'll debate it, them any time of the day you want. Uh, any, we would love to set that the up. AOC, that. she's great at killing jobs. She kills jobs by the thousands. You know, another New Jersey problem. Where did Amazon take their jobs? They took them away from her. She threatened to sue them if they created jobs. I mean, this is a reality. There's a reality that- the business, There's a little more to it, but let's not really well, debate that. Well, you know, sorry, I'm just telling the truth. He's, he's saying what a lot of people are saying, especially what happened with that Amazon thing here in New York. Just Ooh, Lemon getting one right at the end there. Absolutely incredible. It must've been opposite day. You can see the way the other anchors, though, they want to act as the litigators, as the lawyers for the Democrat policies, right? And of course, what he said, what Mr. Wonderful said was, I'll debate her, I'll debate Hoko, I'll debate AOC on this stuff any day. Little just side anecdote about what happened there with the AOC Amazon thing. You may remember, Amazon was going to bring a massive, massive factory to New York. It was, it was actually about uh, 10 or 15 miles from my parents' house, the house that I grew up in that my parents are still at now. For those few weeks when, the, when it looked like it was gonna happen, house prices in the area spiked because they were gonna bring in something like 10,000. I think it might've even been more. It doesn't even matter what the exact amount, number is. Thousands and thousands of new jobs. And what comes with new jobs is new people moving into the community. And then you know what new people need? They need homes to live in. So house prices in my parents' neighborhood were jumping because they were gonna have competition on houses and then people would've, competed on house prices, and it would have been good for everybody. Somebody that lived in, say, an economically depressed area, now Amazon comes in, holy cow, we have a Starbucks on our corner, and the house prices are going up, and you're not gonna believe it. Now there's more tax money to go to the system, and they're hot diggity dog, they're uh, paving the roads. Isn't that wild? But AOC killed the freaking thing, and she did it in the name of social justice, because we must destroy Amazon. I have my issues with Amazon. I try not to use Amazon as much as possible. We do use it, I'm not gonna lie, right? We have kids here. I got two young kids. There's a lot of stuff we need and some of it you need really quick and Amazon can get it to you quick, but I try as much as possible not to, but I don't go out of my way to destroy the company thinking that I'm doing something good while really all I'm doing is hurting the average guy who is gonna get a decent paying job and then be able to move into a nice house hopefully and everything else. Anyway, O'Leary continued just to decimate the blue states, and it is just obvious and true and real, and I know you know it, but it's nice that it's making its way to CNN. It's the state where I grew my kids. I mean, our family grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. We left there to move to Florida like everybody else is because it's such a tough place to, you know, this is a tough message. People really are critical about this, but somebody has to call it out because this is a competition of states now and we don't put money there anymore. We put it in other places and jobs are created elsewhere. Over time, this is gonna diminish New Jersey, diminish New York, diminish Massachusetts, 
and California, out of business. Out of business. El Morte. No business there. You can't do business there. I don't know what that place is going to turn into. Maybe a tourist zone, but no business. Imagine San Francisco. You can't even walk at night out in the street. Sorry. Can what's happening? You can't even walk during the day on the street in San Francisco, but he's right, everyone knows it. And again, you don't have to even dive into all of the numbers about economics and crime and everything else. You would simply just have to look at which way people are moving. Is there a mass exodus from Texas and Florida or a mass influx of people? I think you know the answer. But I, then we saw this, this is from CBS News, covering the mass exodus from California. But watch the way the machine frames this. Everyone knows, including the people that are sitting in this room with me and all of the people I moved with two companies and everyone I meet in Florida every single freaking day when I'm at the supermarket, wherever I am, all of these refugees that come here. And no one ever, ever, I kid you not, no one has ever said to me, I moved here because of the taxes, meaning that we don't have income tax here in Florida and it's high in California. People knew what they were paying in California, but you sort of did it. You were close to Malibu maybe. You like going to wine country. Okay, LA, Hollywood. There was something cool about it maybe 10 years ago. Uh, no one that, I, everyone that I meet here, they say the same thing. Well, it was the crime. It was the drugs. I wanted to be free. I didn't want to force my kids to be masked and vaxxed and everything else. And then what almost everyone says right after that is, and then the tax thing is kind of nice. And I think that's the way I framed it a million times. The fact that I'm saving money to be here is completely bananas. I would have paid money to get in. DeSantis, if you're watching, I think we should start charging people an entry tax. Anyway, watch the way CBS News covers the mass exodus out of California. And tell me if you think this is uh, relatively honest, and connecting to all of the things that we all know. Well, Americans are leaving California and New York in droves. New census data revealed half a million people left California during the COVID pandemic. CBS's Joy Benedict joins me now to explain the reason behind the mass exodus. Good evening, Joy. Good evening, Jerika. That's right. Believe it or not, as you mentioned, folks are packing up. They are leaving, making these big moves, saying goodbye to cities like here in Los Angeles, New York and Chicago. And the main reason why is money. Californians are loading up and moving out. As the appeal of the Golden State seems to be tarnishing at least for some. It's just not sustainable in terms of cost of living. Preston Lee is leaving Los Angeles for Austin, Texas. It's incomparable. There, the house that we bought was 700,000 for four bedroom, four and a half bathroom, 4,000 square feet. You can't get an apartment for that here. More people are exiting California than any other state. New York is second. Many of those leaving are now calling Florida and Texas home. Kafir Cohen owns a moving company. How much more business have you seen? I would say there was a um, growth of uh, almost 100%. So it, uh, our job was uh, like almost uh, double itself. I kid you not, I didn't realize this when I saw the clip earlier. I think that's the guy that I used to move. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I think I've had conversations with that guy. Anyway, or maybe we, we negotiated with him or something. It definitely looks familiar to me or sounds familiar. Um, anyway, putting that aside, the numbers are right there. You saw the numbers, about 800,000 new people here in Florida, and I think that's on the low end of it. And as you know, about 1,200 people move here a day. And when I interviewed Governor DeSantis last week, he talked about how one of the things that we're gonna have to do here in Florida is escalate building projects because we want people to have affordable housing. We want there to be roads so there isn't all the congestion and everything else. But isn't it interesting? They only frame that about money. They somehow didn't mention anything about all of the crime and the rampant riots and the BLM Antifa stuff. And that where I lived in Los Angeles, which was an extremely nice area, that the entire Ventura Boulevard was basically burned down and defunct and devoid. Or that San Francisco has become a zombie apocalypse because of fentanyl and meth. Somehow it's none of those things. It's just these people, they just want bigger houses, guys. How that happened, they all decided that during COVID, I guess, which was pretty bizarre. Uh, but you guys see it. The, the proof is in the pudding with all of these things. And uh, yeah, where are people going? Well, it's not just that they're moving down here. They're also vacationing down here like my parents last week. Ron DeSantis tweeted this out. Florida broke our visitation record with more than 137.6 million visitors in 2022. And this was in spite of the Biden administration's unscientific vax mandate for overseas travelers. Uh, let us all not forget, of course, I went into my British accent again of the guy reading the New York Times. Let us all not forget 
that also AOC and several other progressive politicians vacationed in Florida while they were locking their own people at home because they're good liberals, you know. Uh, Governor DeSantis, who is doing this blueprint situation, right? He is blueprinting for the rest of the country how to fix all of this because we have done it so right here and that's what we have needed. How do you fix it at the state level and then export that? That's what his book is about, The Courage to Be Free, which came out last week. I think they'll find out tomorrow if it's number one on New York Times list, but New York Times is all horseshit anyway. It doesn't really matter. So it'll be kind of funny either way. Either they have to do it because it'll be so obvious or they don't do it, in which case he can expose them for it. Kind of beautiful. Uh, anyway, he is making the rounds. And he was in California over the weekend. Here he is at the Reagan Library, just laying down some truth. I know you guys got a lot of problems out here, but your governor's very concerned about what we're doing in Florida. So I figured I had to come by. Yeah, and then you know what he did? You know what he did? He laid out policies that could fix California. I have no doubt that California will not go for those policies. They rejected the recall. They, they re-elected Gavin Newsom, who I believe is a lizard person from another planet. I do not mean that as a joke. Something is not right there. I believe he is a cold-blooded lizard wearing a human skin outfit. Um, and they re-elected him by a landslide, so so be it, California. Uh, but DeSantis is right. He continued uh, in the speech talking about how people know it's right here and that's what we have to show them and get more of them to support. If someone like you were to run for president, could this be done on a national level? So I think all the ideas uh, that, that we talk about in the book and the successes we have, I do think there's a majority of the American people uh, that would support it. I mean, you think about it, Florida has been a microcosm of the country for a long time. You know, we're winning places like Miami, Dade County. Right, by ages. You know, that's going to bode well for, for other parts uh, of the country now. If you talk about at the federal level, there are certain things that may be easier actually to do, because I think that with the vast administrative state, if you have a determined executive uh, who knows how to use those levers of power, uh, I think you could do a complete upheaval of the deep state. I believe it, too. I believe it, too. And I think you believe it. But now it's going to take something else. Right. Because we're constantly swimming, swimming upstream. Right. The machine, the culture wars, the comedians, like the whole thing. We're always swimming against it in an off election year. Uh, you know, there should have been a red wave. There wasn't. We have to accept that whether it's ballot harvesting or a, brunt, a bunch of brainwashed people, we have to accept that we're fighting something that we we don't automatically win. But there are ways to win. And that's why the state by state blueprint that I think DeSantis is laying out is the best way to go about doing this. Not just these crazy sweeping statements like I'm going to upend everything and save everything like proof in the pudding kind of stuff that is happening here at our hyper functional free state of Florida. But it continues because this weekend was also CPAC and CPAC is obviously the big conservative uh, conference that they do every year. It doesn't seem like it has the, the zest uh, or maybe the energy that it's had in years past. But Lee Zeldin was there. Lee Zeldin, of course, you guys know, he was the congressman from New York who almost pulled off the craziest upset ever in New York. DeSantis was pulling for him at a massive, massive rally just days before the election. Oddly, Hochul had no rallies, right? There were no rallies, but somehow they win. So again, you gotta, you gotta give the devil his due. Like we can just make fun of them all day, but somehow these people win and they stay in power and they do horrible things to their citizens and their citizens say, thank you, sir. May I have another? Uh, but Lee Zeldin at CPAC was talking about how conservatives, good, decent conservatives and good, decent liberals, and remember, there still are some and we gotta find them, how if we could freaking uh, create an alliance between these two people, we could stop the leftist whack jobs. Watch this. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, we need to be competing everywhere in all 50 states. I don't care what state you come from. There are important races, especially down ballot. And we saw it instead of New York sending six Republicans as part of our delegation to D.C., we ended up sending 11. We end up flipping control of the House of Representatives. Nancy Pelosi is no longer speaker. We need yes. to go into Democratic areas, and the best way to get Democrat votes is not to act like Democrats, but to explain why we are proud, principled conservatives. And don't pander. If you go speak to a black group or a Hispanic group or an Asian vote or Jewish group, don't say, I love black people vote for me, I love Asian people vote for me, I love Hispanic people vote for me. Say, we need to improve safety on these streets. Here is how. These are our proposals. We need to improve the quality of education inside of your kids' schools. Here's how. 
These Democrats are unhappy with the Democratic policies and the Democratic Party as a whole, but they aren't going to just swing to the Republicans on their own. It's a bad assumption that we are making. Instead, what we need to do is to show up over and over and over again. When your high-paid political consultant tells you not to go to a heavily Democratic area, that's exactly where we need to show up and earn the support of these Democrats. We cannot relinquish the cities. We cannot relinquish the suburbs. Okay, there's a lot there that I agree with. I, I want to just I'll do the one thing that I maybe slightly disagree with, which is the cities. I, I just think the cities are so out of whack. The machinery of, let's say, a New York and a San Francisco and all that, it is so entrenched in everything else that I don't know that the cities can be saved. But the states can be saved, right? And good, decent liberals who will flee those cities, and they're already fleeing those cities, they can be uh, approached. They can be talked to. This is what, I, I don't know anyone that has done the ex-lib thing uh, more effectively than me. I don't mean it as a pat on my back. I mean it as just, this is what I was freaking doing and here we are, right? But he is right. You go to those places. You go to those places and you say, um, you remember when, you're, when your town wasn't overrun with crime and drugs and you're upset because you're, you know, your kid's hooked on fentanyl. You may not realize this, but this has something to do with the policies of the Democrats who let the border be porous so that these people could come in with drugs. And if you can make that connection, the person who has the kid who's on drugs might go, okay, I can't vote for people who are for, in essence, open borders anymore. And if you go, well, wait a minute, why is it that the crime is so high? And then, and they're, cause they don't want crime, high crime, obviously. And they go, well, wait a minute, it is true that my local representative, say in Minneapolis, Ilhan Omar, was screaming about defunding the police for two years. Then we did it and murder went up by something like 400%. If we can connect these ideas, but then as he said, at the end, it doesn't mean that they're gonna vote Republican until you make a case for yourself. That is the case that DeSantis has made here and that's why he won by 20 points. So guys, we have, we have everything we need right in front of us. We just gotta keep going. And I would say in summation, this is the longest show we've ever done and if I dare say so myself, it's been pretty solid despite that screw up 81 minutes ago. 82 minutes, Jesus. Um, one final thing is, it's not just that we have to fix this politically, we obviously do. We have to keep breaking the machine and everything else, uh, but we also must build new things. And Russell Brand, who we started with about an hour and 20 ago, was also on Joe Rogan talking about how the more the censorious machine gets, the more censorious the machine gets, the more that it will allow for alternative things to rise. And uh, yes, I agree controversial because yeah. we never we never yeah. change shit but they they do things to get people to self-censor of course and rumble doesn't do that it was the, well yeah exactly what was difficult for us when we were when youtube was our primary platform is something we would look at your content all right that's the title of this rogan video on um, this is the content okay well we can try that and then we would get demonetized and it yeah. becomes like a weird algebra you change this word you mm -hmm. change that word you have to order it you have there's certain things you just you know that you can't say and you still get some money from like youtube red yeah right? you still get but it was like th they were doing things and I mean, I, they're running a business. I understand it from their perspective. Of course. You know, they're running a business. They have advertisers. I understand it from their perspective. But from a content creation perspective, you just couldn't trust them. This is what uh, Rumble were fundamentally offered. They gave me a good deal and the assurance that we're not going to censor you. Now, obviously, coming from where I come from politically and in terms of my background, even as a person that's been in the public for a while, I'm like, I, I know how Rumble's being portrayed. It's being portrayed as a right wing, like, you know, far right place, conspiracy theorist. Yeah, you and Glenn Greenwald, super yeah. far right. Yeah, like this married <laughs> gay Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> journalist. Tulsi Gabbard, super right wing. Yeah, like, it's, it's nuts. It's nuts what people call it. It's just anything alternative to the censorship model they'll talk of as right wing. So you guys get it. You will always be framed as a right-wing maniac and any new product that comes in and is effective will be framed as for right-wing crazy people or by right-wing crazy people or anything else. But I would much rather be with the right-wing crazies who actually aren't that crazy than the leftist lunatics who have set this entire game up so that everything that we all hold dear and precious will be destroyed. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our longest show in the history of the Rubin Report. I have to pee, to be quite honest.
but I'm not going to take a break. We are going to roll right into the post game show in just a moment. We've got a, oh wait, it's me Monday. Let's show the me Monday before we do anything. That's my me Monday for today. Lori Lightfoot got a new job. Very, very exciting. And you can see how excited the customer is. So that is pretty, pretty great. Uh, you can join us at rubenreport.locals.com if you want to play on me Monday. And also the post game show will be there right now. We'll take comments, questions. Did I screw anything up? Please let me know. Uh, we leave you, oh, my full episode, if you haven't seen it yet, with Peter Thiel just went up yesterday. The clips had been up earlier. So if you want to check that out, it's up across platforms. We leave you with AOC, drag queen, blah, 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 blah. And I will see everybody in about 41 seconds. Adios. And every night I would come home and the only thing that would help me disconnect and unplugged was watching Drag Race. Wow. Oh, that was, that wow. was the thing that I did every single night. And to be in this moment is just so humbling and amazing. And I'm just trying to drink it up the way you all are. It's just so crazy that like, Somebody so important in this country would take the time out of their life to come here. Not only <laughs> you being here, but to hear that you love and appreciate what we do and that it helps affect change throughout the universe. And like hearing that from you, who is so, you know, amazingly powerful and impactful to our society right now. So I'm so appreciative. I know everybody here is too. So thank you. Like, yeah. We are literally gagged that you're sitting right here.